Hello everyone, good morning. Okay, so we've covered most of the electronics related topics till now. And in the remaining uh, lectures, we will talk about electrical networks. Now, in the first class, I had told you and we had discussed what is the difference between electrical and electronic uh, components, right? Or why, why are these two separate quantities? While the laws uh, remain the same, right? Like KVL remains the same, whether you're talking about an electrical circuit or an or a electronic circuit. However, the major difference between the two is the voltage at which these two uh, circuits operate. As a result, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you uh, will go through the video on familiarization with electrical lab components, right? And you'll also take this virtual tour. You must have also taken the virtual tour of the electronics lab. And if you carefully look at the components and if you look at Tinkercad and if you look at the corresponding components that we have in the electrical lab, the purpose remains the same, right? Like I have a small resistor of, I need a resistor of say 100 ohms, right? The one that I need for electronic purposes will have very low current flowing through it, right? And as a result, the resistor that I use of 100 ohms in electronics lab will have a low power rating. because it has to deal with what? One or two amperes or maximum 10 amperes at any time, right? So normally the resistors you will see in electronics lab, they are of like 0.25 watt. This is the uh, power rating, okay? 0.5 watt, one watt, two watts, like this, okay? Normally it will not go to a very high power rating. And which is why these resistors are very small. They are made up of very, uh, very thin material. Right? And then their overall resistance is 100 ohms. But the moment I speak of 220 volt, right, the power rating has to be very high. Because if you use a low power rating in a circuit, low power rating resistor in a circuit in which current was actually much more than what it can handle it or if, it were, if the power dissipated through that uh, resistor was much more than its power rating then the resistor is going to burn out it's going to get damaged right which is why in electrical lab you will notice that for the same thing that we could have done with a potentiometer a small potentiometer in electronics lab we need to use a rheostat the same thing we could have done with a, uh, a small resistor, we will we will use resistive loads, like they'll be huge and they'll be bulky in, uh, in nature, okay? This is the major difference between electrical and electronic uh, components, electrical quantities. The power rating is much higher, the voltage rating is much higher, okay? The laws of circuit analysis remain the same. So with that, as we start, our discussion on electrical networks today. Let us first uh, discuss the convention of power that we will be using and what all we'll be covering in today's lecture. So we will talk about what is the meaning of an ideal voltage source or a current source. Okay. We will talk about what is linearity and superposition. We've touched upon these topics earlier, but we'll talk a little bit more in context. We'll also look at source transformation because our focus on studying these topics is simply to help us or help us learn tools that will uh, enable solving a question in a very simple way or simplifying a very complicated circuit uh, and make it simpler, right? And then we'll talk about Thevenin's theorem. And Norton's theorem. So let us, let us look at what is the meaning of these ideal voltage and current source. Normally, we've seen this several times in the circuit. A voltage source is a device 
which can which can supply constant voltage that means it can maintain constant voltage across it irrespective of the current flowing through it okay? that is what is an ideal voltage sources it can maintain a constant voltage across its terminal irrespective of how much current is flowing through it similarly an ideal current source which is shown like this a circle and an arrow an ideal current source can maintain a constant current through it irrespective of what is the voltage across it and then you will see dependent sources and you have seen this already when we discuss the large signal model of a transistor so uh, you can also have sources in the in in terms of dependent variables so you can have a dependent voltage source you can have a dependent current source it is shown inside a diamond diamond shape uh, symbol and the moment i have a diamond shape symbol we should know that this is a dependent source and if it is plus minus that means it is a dependent voltage source that means the voltage across these two terminals depends on some quantity somewhere so this could have been say k times vx means vx is some voltage somewhere in the circuit right and the voltage of this source depends on k times vx or it could have been say some i times y i y this current is some current flowing through some part of the circuit on which this uh, voltage depends okay so dependent sources can also be voltage dependent or current dependent this is a dependent voltage source and if i said k times vx this would have become a voltage controlled current source if instead this was k times ix means it depends on current of some part of the circuit this becomes current controlled sorry voltage controlled voltage source current controlled voltage source okay either way it remains a voltage source similarly this also this is a current source dependent current source and it can be voltage controlled or current controlled these are constant current sources a uh, constant sources and i'm not writing which one is voltage and which one is current you know that already right now these are ideal if you have a practical source you know that any practical source will always have some internal resistance as well okay there will always be an internal resistance and this is what the supply would be okay so this is how a practical source looks like a practical voltage source with a resistor in series the representation of a of a practical current source is that you have a current source and in series in parallel with it you have an internal resistance this is just for representation note that if you wanted a dependent source if you go to the market and you say bhaiya ek volt dependent voltage source dena wo nahi milega theek hai because that's not what this means this is not a real physical circuit you this is a representation of some circuit component or some circuit behavior where some parameter is dependent on some other parameter in the sense if you remember when we were making bjt and we used dependent voltage source towards the collector side and we said the value of this voltage no we had used a dependent current source towards the collector and we said the value of this is i s e to the power v b e by v t v b e was voltage across some other pair of terminals somewhere in the circuit is dependent source always uh, depend linearly no not necessarily so right now you are seeing the one that we saw in uh, bjt that was not a linearly dependent source okay but for uh, it to be a linearly dependent source it is important that whatever parameter it depends on if it depends on say some vx or iy 
it should be in the first order it should not be exponential okay it should be related to the first order. it should be proportional to the first order of that term uh, that term it should not be second order or third order then it becomes non linear and on this point let us let, we'll also talk about linearity but just before that solve one quick question for me so that uh, our conventions are clear and note that the uh, the chapter that i'm referring to for these topics is the book by hayt and kemerly chapter 5 okay useful circuit uh, theorems something like that okay so the question is compute the power absorbed by each element in this circuit okay and what will be the convention that we will follow if i have an element like this okay some element i don't know what this is whether this is resistor whether this is a source whatever right if there is a voltage across it v okay and the current flows from higher potential to lower potential if this is the direction of current then we will say power is i is v into i okay if the current is in the opposite direction like it would be in some in sources at times then this quantity will come out to be negative so this what, what we are finding right now this is the power absorbed if this terms if this term comes out to be negative that means power is not absorbed power is delivered or supplied so if you keep in mind this convention then your answer will never be wrong okay potential difference is if this is the potential difference difference and this is the direction of current that means current flowing from higher potential to lower potential okay so with that in mind quickly tell me this is my circuit what is the power absorbed by each of these elements it is 2 va where so we have a dependent source where this is va okay this is 30 ohm and this is 120 volt very quickly tell me what is the power absorbed by each of these elements so power 120 volt all the elements so how much does 30 ohm resistor absorb how much does this dependent source absorb and how much does this 15 ohm resistor absorb quickly tell me in watts so if i solve this apply kvl what does it mean i'm my convention is to start if i'm entering negative terminal i'll write minus right so it this becomes minus 120 plus 30 i so this is i current plus 2 va minus va equal to 0 means minus 120 plus 30 i plus va equal to 0 now what is va if this is the direction of current va is potential in the opposite direction that means can i say va is nothing but minus 15 i like 15 times minus i so i'll just plug that in here and this gives me i is equal to 8 amperes if i know i and i know the direction so my direction that i have assumed this is correct so 
this would be how much so you notice how this source is already like violating our our convention this is positive with respect to negative but current flows in this direction that means this will be minus 8 times 120 so this will come out to be minus 960 watts and you've got minus 960 because this source does not absorb any power this source actually provides or supplies 960 watt 30 ohm resistor very simple i square r 1920 watt dependent source dependent source this is the direction, this is the uh, direction of current. So it's going to come out to be positive. So 2VA, this is the voltage, V into I, right? I was 8. And VA is minus 15I. So minus 15 times I. This should give us minus 1920 watts and 15 ohm 15 ohm pretty simple i square r this should give us 960 watt okay so we have two sources which supply power and two sources which absorb power and the conservation of uh, uh, energy holds here because the total power Supplied is equal to total power absorbed because the net is zero. Just wanted to show this uh, so that we are on the same page regarding the convention that we are following. Okay. And you understand how you will deal with dependent sources. You have a dependent source. It is a voltage source here. It depends on voltage across some other part of the circuit. So just plug those values in and then plug in the value of the dependent variable as well. And because these are all linear circuits, these ter terms are linearly related, you will always be able to substitute and solve. Okay. It will never happen that you don't know where to what to plug in next. Any question here? Okay, no questions. Fine. We now move on to the next topic before we talk about linearity. And we've mentioned this a couple of times earlier, and that is the principle of superposition. So whenever I say that a circuit is a linear circuit or a system is a linear system, it is important that the principle of superposition applies there or it holds there. Okay. So the principle of superposition states that the response, and by response we mean some desired voltage or current, in any linear circuit having more than one independent source can be obtained by adding the responses caused separately by independent sources acting alone. So let me write it response and by response we mean desired current or voltage in a linear circuit having more than one independent sources can be obtained by adding the responses or other responses caused by separate independent sources acting 
alone. Means if you have a linear circuit and it is really a linear circuit in the sense it is there is a linear relationship between the voltage current characteristics of the elements inside the, your circuit, right? So if it's if all the elements, the sources and the passive elements, all these are linear elements, then your circuit is a linear circuit and it should follow the principle of superposition. And what does the principle say? That if you have, if you try to find the response or say current voltage in any branch anywhere, right? And you have more than one independent sources, then the actual response can be obtained by adding the response caused by separate independent sources as if only one source was acting at any given time if you find those responses and you add you uh, add them all together you should get the total response let us also write we will see we will solve this uh, through a problem let us also formally write what is the meaning of a linear circuit Linear circuit is made up of linear elements. And what is a linear element? A linear element is a passive element. What is a passive element? It does not supply any power to the circuit. It is not capable of supplying power to the circuit, right? So a linear element is a passive element which has having a linear voltage current relationship. What do we mean by linear current voltage relationship? That suppose there was some element which had a voltage across it V and it had a current I flowing through it. If I multiply the current by a factor, some, some constant factor K, right, and the new current becomes I, then the corresponding voltage should also become K times previous voltage. Now, what are the elements you know that which you know for sure that they have a linear current voltage relationship? Resistor, obviously, because voltage is proportion current is proportional to voltage v is equal to i r in a resistor if i look at capacitors and inductors you will be like nahi wahan pe to aisa relationship nahi hota hai but there how are current and voltage uh, related to each other It's either related through a derivative operator or it is related through an integration operator. Both derivative and integration, both of these are linear operators. Why? Because if I was finding derivative of some term like this, like this is this is due to some say two sources, this is same as saying. dx by dt, dx2 by dt, right? Similarly, if I had integration of two terms, this is same as saying integration of first term and integration of second term. So capacitors and inductors, although their relationship may not be a straight line, like how it is in resistor, but in capacitors and inductors also, the current voltage relationship is defined by a linear operator. It's a linear relationship. So capacitors and inductors can also be considered as linear elements. Okay. If you remember, we studied op-amps. It's obvious that BJT is not a linear circuit, right? Because in a BJT, the current across one terminal is dependent on exponential. It's exponentially dependent on the voltage, right? So it is not a linear circuit. Similarly, diode is also not a linear circuit, right? A junction diode is not a linear circuit. We, of course, then simplified it and made it act as if it knows only short circuit and open circuit, right? So we kind of linearized it, piecewise linearized it. But 
in principle diode and bjt are not linear circuits but when we made an opam and you know that opam is inside opam would be uh, uh, transistors only in differential amplifier configuration but we started calling opam as a linear circuit why because when we look at the overall operation of the opam and we look at the look at what exactly happens if the opam has an open loop gain a then whatever is the difference between these two terminals vd the output is simply a times vd okay so it just multiplies it with a factor a the difference is multiplied with a factor a that is why an opam is considered to be a linear circuit if you look at the in like in depth if you look at its characteristic for every frequency or for every uh, range of uh, bandwidth it may not be linear okay but the band the range of frequencies for which it offers a constant gain that means inside its bandwidth we assume it to act as if it's a linear circuit and only then you know we were able to solve opam questions uh, by using superposition like one of the questions in the quiz also needed you to use superposition if we use thevenin equivalent to solve a part of the circuit how we were able to use all those tools because we assumed that opam was a linear circuit Okay. So now that we understand this, the principle of superposition, how to apply it, the principle of superposition essentially says that, okay, here let us also write a note on what is the meaning of linear dependent sources since this question came up. If I have dependent sources and I'm saying they are linear dependent sources, means that the proportionality is with respect to the first power of voltage or current okay it should not go beyond first power second power and all it will become non-linear and what so what does the principle of superposition says that see i had to find a uh, voltage in some part of the circuit let me call it v out v v v0 okay let's say v0 and i have say two sources in the circuit that means v0 can be given as if the v0 due to source number 1 plus v0 due to source 2 such that source 1 was acting alone and then source 2 was acting alone okay or current somewhere is due to source 1 plus current due to source 2 so let us take an example of this. So you know how to solve this already, but I'm going to take a very simple circuit and you'll tell me how you can prove the principle of superposition, okay? So I have a circuit like this. I have two sources. I have a voltage source and I have a current source of 2 ampere. This is 6 ohm, this is 9 ohm and I need you to find current through this 9 ohm branch, let us call it Ix, using the principle of superposition. Okay. So using the principle of superposition means that we will first disable an, another source and keep only first source. Okay. So let me call this one as source one, source one, and this is source two. Okay. So when I say, when I use the term disable a source, disable an independent source, what do I mean? means if it was a voltage source, you set its value to zero. If it's a current source, you set its value to zero. Setting a voltage source value to zero means what? Short circuiting the voltage source. Means if the source was a voltage source, then you short circuit it to disable it. And reducing the current of a current source to zero means 
ओपन सर्किट द करंट सोर्स सो प्रिंसिपल ऑफ सुपरपोजिशन सेज दैट आई एक्स शुड बी इक्वल टू आई एक्स ड्यू टू सोर्स वन प्लस आई आई एक्स ड्यू टू सोर्स टू बोथ एक्टिंग अलोन राइट एस टू so let us find these individually how to find them so let s1 be equal to 0 s1 equal to 0 that means i am redrawing this circuit and this is 2 ampere i have shorted out this right and the current in this branch now due to just this one this is what we are calling as ix due to s2 or ix just due to the 2 ampere current source what will be this value current divider 0.8 ampere that means 6 upon 6 plus 9 into 2 0.8 ampere okay let S two be equal to zero. That means, ye, how much was this? Three volt. That means I'm disabling it. Let the current through this nine ohm resistor now be called I X due to S one. What will be I X due to S one? Point two milliampere. That means by by superposition, I X should be equal to I X when just one source was acting plus I X when the when only the other source was acting. That means point eight plus point two, which should be equal to one ampere. Is this actually correct? Can you verify this from this circuit? You know how to use. KCL. So if I said, you know, don't use superposition. Use a uh, use uh, KCL. So how much would I X would have come in that case? You would have used KCL and said said that okay, this node. Let me call this node as node potential V. And now if I solve it, this current plus this current should be equal to I X, right? So at this node. I can write this particular current in six ohm branch as three minus V upon six plus this current incoming two. This should be equal to outgoing current V upon nine, V minus zero upon nine. I'm assuming this is ground. So this would have given me V equal to. You solve this, V would have come out to be nine, and as a result, I X would have come out to be nine up. V upon nine. That means nine upon nine, which is one ampere. Okay, so we've we've verified it also. This is how you can use the principle of superposition. Any questions here? Okay. The next topic is. source transformation and as the name suggests this will help us transform a current source into a voltage source or a voltage source into a current source for the purpose of simply what is happening across the load terminals that means if i had a voltage source if i had a current source like this having a resistor Say this is some IS. This is some RS. If I'm looking across this this pair of terminals, okay, these are my IS. Looking simply across this pair of terminals, I can say that this can be transformed wherever I have this in my circuit across a pair of terminals AB. i can replace this or i can transform this into a voltage source 
having RS now in series and the value of the voltage would be ISRS. Note that this transformation is true purely from a load perspective. That means if I'm just looking across A and B, then I can say they are equivalent. Okay. They may not be equivalent internally. That means it is not that wherever you had this in the circuit and you replace it with this in the circuit, it doesn't mean that now, now you know, this, this resistor, this is a new resistor whose value is also RS. It is not the same resistor. Okay. Just to understand what I'm saying here, uh, let us let us just see how does Pele let us see uh, when I'm saying that these can be treated in, uh, equivalently. Is it even true? I'm saying that this circuit, how this circuit would treat a load, this circuit would treat the load in the exact same way, and that is why I'm calling them as equivalent. Okay, so let us put some values here. Let us say this is a three ampere source and this is a 2 ohm resistor so its equivalent voltage source transformation would be 6 volt and 2 ohm right let us see how both of these circuits treat a 4 ohm load means if i add a 4 ohm load across their pair of terminals do they treat this in the exact same way if they do then these two circuits are equivalent right so, in the first case, can you quickly tell me what would be the current through this 4 ohm resistor and what would be the power absorbed by this 4 ohm resistor? So, current is 1 ampere and power is 4 watts in the first one. In the second one, Current is 1 ampere, power is still 4 watts. Right. So, we see that they treat, both these circuits are treating the load in the exact same way. Right. Same current, same power dissipated. As a result, we don't have to calculate, but there will be same voltage also across these two resistors. So, they treat a load in the exact same way. Great. But is everything happening inside this circuit also equivalent? That means, can you find out what is the power absorbed by this or uh, supply sorry power supplied by this 3 ampere source what is the power absorbed by this 2 ohm resistor twelve watts right so you want to say minus twelve watt so you're saying twelve watt supplied okay and then two ampere uh, two uh, ohm I square R, so 8 watt, okay. This is for the first case, right? For the second case, can you tell me what is the power supplied by this 6 volt battery and the power absorbed in this 2 ohm resistor? Minus 6 into 5. So minus, minus 6 watt, so 6 watt supplied. And this is right. So, if you look at them internally, the 2 ohm resistor here is absorbing 8 watt, while the 2 ohm resistor here in its equivalent is absorbing 2 watt, not 8 watt, right? So, it's not the same resistor. The 3 ampere source. In this case, was supplying 12 watt. In this case, it is supplying only 6 watt. Right? So, when we say these circuits are equivalent, they are equivalent only in terms of what transpires across this pair of terminals. Like, uh, what transpires across the load. Only in that sense, they are equivalent. Internally, they are not equivalent. So, when we do this kind of a transformation to solve any circuit or to simplify a circuit, it should be clear to us that internally, they are not, every term, every e component is not equivalent to another component in the circuit. Okay. It is only across this pair of terminals that they behave 
this whole thing how it treats a load is the same as how this whole thing treats the same load in that sense they are equivalent okay so let us write this also the two sources you know you notice that the total remains the same right so 4 plus 8 minus 12, it is still 0. And 4 plus 2 minus 6, it is still 0. So we say the two sources are equivalent only with respect to what happens. across the load terminal which means how this how it treats the load it treats the load in the exact same way that is why we are saying it is equivalent okay they are not equivalent internally All right. Any questions here? Okay. That takes us to the next topic. And we've already discussed this once, and this is Thevenin's equivalent. You notice how in this course we are more interested in equivalent circuits. Okay, so so this is not Thevenin equivalent. This is Thevenin's theorem. Okay. So what Thevenin's theorem says is that if you have any linear network, that means there are some resistive terms, there is voltage source, there is current source, right? And if I'm looking across a pair of terminals AB, whatever a load will see across this pair of terminals can simply be represented as if it is just a voltage source with a resistances series. And this voltage is called Thevenin equivalent voltage. And this resistance is called Thevenin equivalent resistance. And whatever is inside this network across A and B can simply be represented in terms of Thevenin voltage and Thevenin resistance as if they are in series with each other. Okay. So the proof of this Thevenin theorem, I will assign you as a Edpuzzle assignment. Please go through it. It, it simply follows from the principle of superposition. But uh, what are these uh, RTH and VTH? RTH is called the equivalent resistance or Thevenin equivalent resistance. What it, what it means is it is the equivalent resistance uh, across A and B. And VTH is nothing but the open circuit voltage across AB. Open circuit voltage means that if I simply now brought a multimeter, let us say this is a multimeter. Open circuit voltage means that now if I just bring this multimeter and place the leads here, what I'm measuring is open circuit voltage. Nothing is connected to these terminals, right? No, no load is connected. So what I'm measuring right now, this is open circuit voltage. So VTH is nothing but the open circuit voltage across terminals AB. Okay. And RTH can be given as VOC upon short circuit current. That means if I was to short this pair of terminals, then whatever current flows in this direction, note the direction. Okay. If I shorted these pair of terminals, then the current that would have flowed from 
A to B, I'm calling that as short circuit current, ISC. And if I simply found the ratio of VOC and ISC, this would have given me RTH. Okay. Alternatively, a simpler way of finding this, every time you don't have to find ISC, if you have a very simple circuit with just some independent sources in it, it's a simple circuit, all you've got to do is just find the equivalent resistance across AB after disabling all independent sources. And remember what I meant by disabling, okay? So shorts, shorting out a voltage source and open circuiting and a, a current source, okay? That means what will be this equivalent resistance if I, in this network, just take these terminals A, B, look in, and you've got only resistors left. You have disabled all voltage sources. That means you've made V equal to zero. And you've disabled current sources. That means you've made current I equal to zero. Okay. Now, if you find, if you took a multimeter, put one lead over here, one lead over here in in the form of ohm meter, you're measuring resistance in that mode. In that case, you would see that this is what is equivalent resistance. If you had uh, dependent sources also present, this method will not work because you cannot disable independent so dependent sources, right? So the same the same idea is also think of it in the in this way that if you had all these independent sources disabled, independent sources are disabled inside. Now think of as if you are connecting some voltage source V test, okay? And because of this voltage source, some current I test flows into this circuit. So do you see that this equivalent resistance that I'm talking about, this can also be given, there is no source inside the circuit right now, right? And if I give, if I apply a test source across this pair of terminals, and because of this test source, some test current flows into this pair of terminals. Then do you see that RTH can also be written as if it is V test upon I test? Because that is what the overall equivalent resistance of this entire network would be acting as if, as if it's just like this. RTH, some I test is flowing due to some V test. Right. So there are multiple ways of finding Thevenin equivalent. VTH is very simple. It is just the open circuit voltage. To find RTH, you may use any of these uh, approaches. You may simply find short circuit current, find the ratio. If there are no independent source, if there are no dependent sources present, then just disable all independent sources and put your ohm meter lead across these two pair of terminals and make, make the measurement. Or a very standard way, if you disable all independent sources in the circuit, just connect a test source. And due to that, that test source, there is a current that flows. Then the ratio of that test voltage and test current, that is also your equivalent resistance. Okay. This is what is Thevenin's theorem. And from source transformation, you can make out that there would be a corresponding Norton's theorem. That, that says exactly the same thing, except that now it says that the same kind of circuit which has voltage sources, current sources, some network, this can be written as if there is a current source, there is a resistor. This is called IN, Norton's current, Norton's resistance. Rn is nothing but the equivalent resistance. 
across AB. This would have followed, right? If you understand source transformation and if you know how to find Thevenin's theorem, you can always write it as a current source. Okay, there's a question. What is V-test? V-test is any external voltage source that we are providing, say, one volt or two volt source that we are providing externally. It's a test voltage externally attached because of which some I test flows. Okay, so in that case also, V test upon I test will be RTH. So RN in Norton's theorem is still equivalent resistance, same as RTH, and IN, this is called Norton's current, and this is equal to short circuit current. Which short circuit current? If you were to short terminals A and B, then whatever ISC would flow, whatever short circuit current would flow, that is what is IN. Okay, and RN in the exact same way can be found as a ratio of open circuit voltage and short circuit current. Following the same principle. So if, if uh, Thevenin's theorem is clear to you, then finding Norton's equivalent will never be a challenge because you can always find Thevenin's equivalent and then just do source transformation and make it into a Norton's equivalent. Okay, so we'll stop here today. And tomorrow we'll do some uh, questions of Thevenin's theorem. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.